Welcome to Arlington Town Hall Auditorium, or as I like to call it this time of year, my home away from home. Um, for those of you who are town meeting members, you know what I mean. <laughs> uh, I'm very excited to be here tonight uh, to conduct uh, and participate in this forum on artificial turf fields. This is an important issue for the town, one in which there are a broad array of opinions. There's a lot uh, to be learned, I think, about artificial turf fields, uh, from how they're made to uh, whether they emit things or whether they're healthy or whether uh, they're fun to play on or all those things, whether we need more playing fields and so forth, a lot of key issues. Uh, my perspective on this uh, is that we are in a learning phase. Uh, so tonight in the session that is co-sponsored by the Conservation Commission and uh, the Parks and Rec Commission, we're here to hear, we are here to hear from some experts. Um, they are here to uh, share their knowledge with us and also um, to take your questions. And I've, as I've said in a previous forum uh, on a different issue, a question is something that ends in a question mark. <laughs> so when you have the chance for a question and answer period, I encourage you to ask questions uh, and would uh, ask you uh, for the good of the forum and for the good of everybody here um, to save your speeches for other, other times and other places. Um, we have uh, cards on your chairs that you can write out questions, and if you, I, that is sometimes a good way to prep a question, to ask it ahead of time. I've seen that at other events. Or if you don't get the chance to ask your question or if something else comes up after you've asked a question, that to then put those questions here. As town manager, I've got to make some decisions, uh, but the next town manager will certainly have to make decisions about uh, artificial turf fields. Um, I expect we're going to learn a lot tonight. I expect that after tonight, there will still be questions that uh, need to be answered. And so I see this as an ongoing process. One of the great things about Arlington is that we uh, have citizens who take interests, who like to get to the facts, uh, and uh, then who like to talk about it. So without further ado, I would like to introduce Amy, our, um, our moderator, uh, to kick things off. Thank you very much. Hi, everyone. My name is Abby Fulham. I'm with the Consensus Building Institute. We're a nonprofit that's based in Cambridge, and we try to help communities have discussions and make decisions about challenging public policy and environmental topics. Um, I'm here today with my colleague, Brandon Chambers. Um, as all of you are incredibly aware, artificial turf is a tense point for the town of Arlington right now. Um, and the most pressing question at the moment is whether or not to adopt a moratorium on the construction of new artificial turf fields or to leave them as an option um, in the case-by-case -case review and permitting process that's used now. And we'll hear a lot more about that shortly. Um, this forum is a very small piece of that larger discussion. It's simply an opportunity to learn about the health, safety, and environmental considerations of artificial turf. And this information, this science, is, a, is one part of how we make decisions. A much larger part is our values and our perception of risk. And those will be talked about as Arlington makes this decision. But they will be talked about at the town meeting and in the commissions. This is not what this forum is for. Um, we will be sticking to the science, to hearing from a panel of experts, and for having an opportunity to ask questions of them. Okay. Thanks, Jim. Um, so the structure of the evening is as follows. We're going to start with the state of the discussion of artificial turf in Arlington, where you'll hear from the town bodies that are considering this topic. Um, the goal here is really to put everything into a larger context of decision making um, and also to learn which bodies are considering this and how to engage more in them. We'll then have a presentation on artificial turf health, safety, and environmental considerations from multiple panelists that are selected by both commissions. 
And we have a panel of presenters here because there's not one expert that could talk to you about artificial turf, about all of the components. Um, and there's not one expert that could say something that everyone would agree with. Um, and so part of the objective is to surface where there's agreement and where there's disagreement among these panelists. Um, we're gonna go straight through the presentation without taking questions because we have a Q&A session right after that. Um, and so for the Q&A session, um, we're doing a rather analog approach here. Um, basically, anyone interested in asking a question will be given the chance to ask one question via a lottery. Um, and so then we'll have two lotteries, one if you wanna share a question orally and one if you'd prefer to share it written in which then someone would read it out loud. Um, and I'll explain it a bit more in detail later, but the cards on your seat, basically, if you wanna share a question orally, you'll write your name on the card and place it in one of the bins during a break. Um, and if you wanna share a written question, you'll write the question on the bin and place it in the appropriate bin at the break. Um, we will then draw questions randomly and then we'll go back and forth between oral and written questions. Um, we are prioritizing Arlington residents, and so we ask non-residents to not submit questions. Um, all right, and then we'll end with some closing thoughts from town manager Sandy Pooler, and then some final logistics from me. Um, throughout the entire forum, we're going to be pretty strict on timing and time limits. We have a lot to get through. We have a lot of people that want to ask questions, and so I will be enforcing those. Um, and then we'll end by 9.30. Okay, lastly, um, a few logistics. One is that my colleague Brandon here is taking notes and we'll, we'll be developing a forum summary that captures the key points of the presentations and the question and answers. And any of the written questions that are shared in the bin will be listed, that we don't get to, will be listed in the summary and sent out. Um, and then we'll also have a feedback form at the end of this for you to share any lingering questions that we didn't answer any feedback that you would like the commissions to hear and any other information or engagement on artificial turf that you would like. Okay, and so with that, we're ready to start the state of the discussion on artificial turf in Arlington. Um, we're gonna hear from representatives of the town bodies so they can clarify their mandates, their missions, the status of the discussion on artificial turf and how residents can engage more. Um, we're going to start with the Conservation Commission and the Chair, Susan Chapnick. Um, every representative will get three minutes uh, to share, and I'll give you visual clue, uh, cues as your time progresses. All right, Susan. Great. Can everybody hear me? No. Can you hear me now? Can you hear me now? Can you hear me now? Great. All right. Good evening. I'm Susan Chapnick. I'm the chair of the Arlington Conservation Commission. The commission is composed of seven full members and one associate member, all of whom are unpaid volunteers. We are supported by David Morgan, who is to my right here. Um, he is the environmental planner and the conservation agent for Arlington. The Conservation Commission protects and manages Arlington's wetlands and conservation lands. The commission issues permits for projects under state and local wetland laws and regulations, specifically the State Wetland Protection Act and the town's wetland protection bylaw. The State Wetlands Protection Act serves to protect eight interests or functions of wetlands, rivers, streams, ponds, and floodplains. These eight interests include public and private water supply, groundwater supply, flood control, storm damage prevention, prevention of pollution, land containing shellfish, which we probably don't have here, and fisheries and wildlife habitat. In Arlington, we also have our wetlands protection bylaw and our implementing regulations, which protect additional interests or functions and I quote, by controlling activities deemed by the Con Conservation Commission likely to have a significant or cumulative effect upon resource area values. These regulations set forth stricter requirements than the State Wetlands Protection Act. Additionally, the Arlington regulations 
require compliance with climate change resilience standards to protect resource areas that may be directly impacted due to extreme weather events, due to surface runoff of pollution, and in wildlife habitat due to changes in temperature. The Commission reviews all proposed activity within regulated areas. These areas include any work within 100 feet of a wetland, lake, or pond, within 200 feet of a river or stream, or within the 100-year floodplain. Anyone proposing to remove, fill, dredge, discharge, build upon, including artificial turf fields, degrade or otherwise alter any resource area, must file an application with the Commission. The Commission then reviews the proposed project during a public hearing process and votes to either approve the project, approve the project with conditions, Susan, can or you wrap it up here? deny the project. Okay. The Commission has granted two permits for projects that include artificial turf playing fields, most recently in 2020 for the Arlington High School field that has not yet been constructed, and previously 12 years ago for the Arlington Catholic artificial turf field. As a member of the Commission, I proposed a prohibition on artificial turf fields as an update to our wetland regulations in January 5, 2023 public meeting. I remove, I understood that the moratorium that the town manager put in place on any new artificial turf projects would be in effect, and therefore I removed this request from the Arlington Wetland Regulations. The January 5th meeting can be heard. Um, it's a recording on the Arlington Conservation Commission website, and the Commission went on to approve amendments to its wetland regulations but those changes do not specifically prohibit artificial turf fields currently. Thank you. Okay, next up we have the Parks and Rec Commission with Chair Phil Lasker. Hello. 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 Whoa, that's loud. <laughs> Sorry about that. Phil Lasker, Chair of the Park and Recreation Commission. Thank you, everybody, for attending. The Park and Recreation Commission is tasked with creating both passive and active recreational opportunities for the community that are inclusive, diverse, and multi-generational. The Commission is made up of dedicated volunteers that are comprised of architects, landscape architects, child care professionals, and educators. We offer safe, affordable, quality programs for all ages and abilities. We have a successful track record of major capital improvement projects. Some recent ones include the RES, Herd Field Renovation to open soon, and numerous playgrounds. The Park and Recreation Commission supports the use of synthetic turf and is opposed to Article 12 or any substitute motion for a moratorium on turf. Why do we want turf fields? Our fields are massively overused, in poor condition despite the best efforts of our DPW, and can't be rested. We are a small urban community, and land is at a premium. We have close to 7,000 participants year-round in youth sports, and there's simply not enough field space. I coach my son's fifth grade soccer team. We share a field for practice at McClellan. At the start of this season, a third team without any field space asked us if they could use the small area of grass between the parking lot and the field, which we of course agreed. Just last week, a fourth team asked if we had any available space for them due to conflicts at Florence with the baseball team practicing at the same time. When we have to make up a home game, there's so limited field space in town that we often have to travel to the opposing team's field just to make it happen which, by the way, is usually turf. If you haven't been on Florence, Thorndike, Hills, or Audison lately, please do. They can barely be considered fields, let alone safe, and this is the start of the season. I imagine there's a good turnout this evening because, once again, our fields are closed due to the weather. 
What are the benefits of turf? They're all weather systems, paired with lights that can be played on virtually 24 seven. Seasons can start end as scheduled. One turf field is the equivalent of three natural grass fields in terms of play. There's enhanced player safety. There's no reports of heat related injuries or otherwise on our existing turf fields. And that's over a decade of experience. There's reduced maintenance costs. Adding a turf field takes the pressure off our natural grass fields, allowing them to rest and recover, thereby improving the conditions of them. All turf fields are tested by independent labs based on current standards for heavy metals, PAHs, and PFAS to ensure the safety of the users and the environment. This is written into the specifications for the high school project, reviewed and approved by the Conservation Commission, and would be part of any future project in town. All turf fields are tested by independent labs for performance surface interactions. Our natural turf fields are not and would never meet these standards. I want to talk a little bit about the Poets Corner project, if you want to go to that. We have an amazing opportunity to transform the town-owned parcel known as Poets Corner, an adjacent parcel owned by the Archdiocese of Boston, St. Camilla's Church, into an expanded community park with lighted turf fields as part of a public-private partnership with Belmont Hill School. This would drastically improve our field space needs. In order for Belmont Hill to move forward and fully fund the project, the fields must be synthetic turf. There are many other site improvements as part of this project for the community, and all that information can be found on the Town of Arlington Recreation website, including newly posted 3D renderings project background, and FAQ about turf. There's an image um, up there on the screen and around the room showing the uh, location of Poets Corner in case anybody doesn't know where that is. Thank you very much. Thanks, Phil. Okay. Let's, let's hold applause, please. Okay. All right. We're going to move now. We're going to move now to the town manager, Sandy Pooler. Thank you. I love it when you applaud when I come up to speak. That is great. Uh, so I'm here to talk a little bit about um, other process in town. Um, this coming, upcoming town meeting and the town meeting it's scheduled, well, will be scheduled for the fall. At this upcoming town meeting, there is an article to put a, uh, it was originally, I think, a three-year moratorium on uh, any building of turf fields going forward. Uh, it is my understanding that there's an amendment to that to limit that to a two-year period. Um, without getting into all of the details about the pluses and minuses of that, um, I will, will just say at this time that at town meeting I will oppose that article. I have, on the other hand, put a moratorium or a study period in place uh, for any further development of turf fields between now and October 28th at noon, which is when I retire. So this will be somebody else's challenge. I thought it was very important to put this study period in place because I think that there are a lot of serious issues that need to be looked at around turf fields. Um, I think there are environmental issues, there are recreation issues, uh, there are cost issues, and so forth. We will touch on some of those today. I also think the issue of um, whether to build a turf field or not on a particular site can and may depend on that site. I think Poets Corner is an interesting case for us to continue to look at. Uh, it is a site that used to be a landfill. It is was capped before modern standards of of capping of landfills were put in place, and so it has a number of problems with it. I believe, uh, without making any judgments tonight, that is something that is worth looking at and considering. That would come before a town meeting next fall. In order to undertake the Poets Corner project, uh, there would have to be an article passed at town meeting essentially to authorize a land swap between uh, the town and the archdiocese and so forth. Um, 
At that, so at that point, town meeting would have the chance to vote on that project. Um, so those going forward are, um, are the next things that are going to happen at town meeting and the next things that a town manager is going to have to decide. Uh, my uh, successor, Jim Feeney, will have to decide about whether, in fact, to go forward at fall town meeting with this proposal for Poets' Corner. And I think the things that we learned tonight and the questions that you ask and the things we'll continue to look at over the spring and through the summer will affect his judgment on that. Um, but that procedurally is where we are. Thank you, Abby. <laughs> I'll just give um, Sandy a quick shout out for being right on the three minute mark. So admirable and we can all learn from it, okay. Um, we're gonna go next to Natasha Waden, who's the public health director, um, who's speaking on behalf of the Board of Health. I th yeah, you don't have a microphone down there. So you can come over here. Good evening. Uh, my name is Natasha Whedon. I am the public health director here for the town of Arlington. Uh, and I've been asked uh, behalf, on behalf of the Board of Health to um, provide a statement to the group here tonight. Uh, first, I'd just like to explain what the mission of the Arlington Board of Health is. So I'm going to read off of my notes. Speak up. Okay. Got it? <laughs> All right. Uh, so the mission of the Arlington Board of Health is to protect the public health of the town of Arlington through enforcement of health codes and regulations while promoting a healthy community. Uh, we do this through the work of, of two, two sort of entities. It's the Board of Health and the Health Department. The Board of Health um, and the Health Department are two distinct but connected entities that are charged with protecting and safeguarding the public and environmental health of the town of Arlington. The Board of Health is a statutory board comprised of three community members. Um, our, our chair of the board tonight is here, um, Dr. Marie Walsh Condon. One of our board members, um, Laura White, professor at BU, uh, is here. And I'm not sure if um, Dr. Peter Rice is in the room, but I would like to just acknowledge those three uh, are the members of our Board of Health. Um, the Health Department is a professionally staffed office within the Town of Arlington's Department of Health and Human Services, uh, and this consists of a director, administrative staff, health inspectors, public health nurses, sailor of weights and measures, and a prevention services coordinator. Generally speaking, the board uh, adopts regulations that provide protections beyond the minimum standards outlined in the Massachusetts general laws and state sanitary code. They also set town-wide policy related to important health issues, while the health department handles the day-to-day -day procedural operations, administrative duties, and executes the various health laws and regulations. We're also tasked with enforcing some of the local bylaws that are passed through town meeting. The health department, um, through the board, has been asked to review the, I'm sorry, the Board of Health uh, has been asked to review the current information as it relates to the installation of artificial turf uh, in town. So I'm going to read this statement from the board. Uh, the Board of Health met on April 5th, 2023 at their regularly scheduled meeting and had the opportunity to discuss with the public health concerns associated with artificial turfs and turf fields in Arlington. Members of the board reviewed material presented by the public health director, conducted independent research on the subject, and heard from members of the public. A town-wide moratorium or prohibition on artificial turf as is proposed in Article 12 is not supported by the board. The board supports a case-by-case -case site assessment conducted prior to the installation rather than an overall prohibition of artificial turf. The board supports a risk reduction approach. Concerns related to artificial turf and human health include PFAS, which can be found in turf fibers, as well as other contaminants such as PAHs, VOCs, often found in the crumb rubber infill. The board also acknowledges concerns about increased risks of abrasions, injuries, and high surface temperature of artificial turf. Because the science continues to evolve and alternative materials have been made available, an, individ an individual assessment of each proposed site should be conducted. The board accepts the evidence that the risks associated with the contaminants may be minimized or reduced through the use of alternative materials. The board does not support the proposal of a study committee, but feels I'm sorry, the board does support the proposal of a study committee, but feels strongly that all named members should be a voting member of the committee. Thank you. All right. Thank you, Natasha. So 
I hope that you all heard that there are many town bodies considering this question and that you've heard a bit about their mission and their mandates and how they're approaching it. Um, yeah. <laughs> um, so we're going to move now into the portion, which is really the bulk and the purpose of this forum, which is to talk about the science and information around artificial turf. Um, we invite you to engage with these commissions and with the town meeting on this topic to share your values, your interests, your opinions. This forum, again, is not the place to do that. It's about learning about artificial turf from a panel of experts and asking clarifying questions. Um, and so, again, we have a panel here. I'm just going to say this again for those coming who came in a bit late, because there's not one expert who could speak about all components of artificial turf, nor is there one agreed upon expert on this topic. Um, our goal here is to feature perspectives from multiple experts and surface the issues where they disagree and where they agree. Um, we will, the flow of this, we're gonna start with a kind of informational, what is artificial or synthetic turf um, presentation, which has been agreed to by both commissions. So we'll only have one presenter for that. And then we'll hear presentations on these topic, on, two, on three topics selected by the commissions, health and safety considerations, environmental considerations, and sustainability. Um, and then for each panel, or sorry, for each topic, we'll hear from panelists from each commission. Um, and then finally, we'll have a chance for um, each commission to respond to the entire presentation or make a closing statement. Um, and because we are trying to maximize the amount of questions we can get to during the Q&A, will, I will be timing these pieces closely um, as a heads up. Okay, so we're going to start with introductions um, so you can get a sense of who the panelists are and their perspectives. And so panelists, we're asking you to share your name, your affiliation, clients or funding sources your organization typically takes on, and recent projects that you've worked on relating to artificial turf. And we're asking you to do this in one minute. <laughs> um, we're gonna go alphabetically, and we're gonna start with Susan Chapnick. Hi, I'm Susan Chapnick. Um, I am on this panel in my capacity, not as a member of the Conservation Commission, but as an environmental chemist and co-owner of a small women-owned business, New Environmental Horizons. Um, my company assists in the assessment, planning, and evaluation of environmental data to help clean up hazardous chemicals at sites in New England and beyond. Our clients include engineering firms and ultimately regulatory agencies. For example, we provided technical assistance to the federal government in its natural resource damage assessment of the Deepwater Horizon Gulf oil spill. Additionally, I'm an appointed member of the Bureau of Waste Site Cleanup Advisory Committee under the Massachusetts Department of Environmental Protection, where I advise on regulations, policy, and guidelines. Most recently, I helped develop climate change vulnerability assessment tools with MassDEP and the Licensed Site Professional Association and provided training on the use of these tools. I have no conflicts to declare, and I am not receiving compensation as a panelist. Okay, thank you. time, perfect. Thank you, Susan. All right, we're gonna go to Jeff. There we go. Hello. Hi, my name is Jeffrey Gentili. I'm one of the co-founders of Firefly Sports Testing. We test all kinds of sports surfaces, including artificial and natural grass, as well as anything else you could follow on. Um, we work all over the country, all over the world. Um, some of our clients are, you know, designers, manufacturers, towns, municipalities, whatever the end user is. Some of my recent projects, Patriots last week, you know, um, Mercedes-Benz, University of Oregon, all of the above. We test more fields than anybody in the country, and we test the highest profile fields in the country. We hold FIFA certifications in both natural and artificial. We hold world athletics, uh, world rugby, a whole lot of other acronyms, futsal, so on and so on. I have no conflict of interest here and I'm not being paid to be here today. Thank you. Um, and we're gonna hold on, our, we have two, okay, here we go, we're ready. <laughs> All right, we have two uh, panelists who will be joining virtually. And so first we're gonna go to Dr. Laura Green. 
<laughs> oh, hello. Um, I'm very sorry I'm not there in person. I'm a bit under the weather. I very much wanted to see you all in person. Uh, my name is Laura Green. I'm a chemist and a toxicologist. Um, I trained in chemistry and toxicology in the 1970s. I've been board certified in general toxicology since the 1980s through the present. I was a part-time lecturer at MIT, um, where I lectured in environmental health and toxicology for 25 years. Uh, and I have founded two companies, um, one entitled Cambridge Environmental, which was a 14-person um, multi-office company that worked both for the United States Environmental Protection Agency on a major pesticide contract uh, which we won several years in a row, uh, and for private clients. Um, I then founded a very small company that I currently am the 51% partner in called Green Toxicology LLC. Um, on the present project, I am working on behalf of the Arlington Recreation Department, Arlington Youth Soccer, Arlington Youth Lacrosse, and Arlington Youth Softball and Baseball. Um, and my major clients have nothing to do with synthetic turf. Um, I spend most of my time uh, Or I'm going to ask you to wrap it up. Thank you. Oh, okay. Well, then I'm done. Okay. <laughs> Thank you. Um, okay. Now we're going to move to Dr. Wendy Heiger-Bernays, who's in the room. Hello. I'm Wendy Heiger-Bernays. I'm a clinical professor of, en of environmental health at the Boston University School of Public Health. For 25 years, my research, my teaching, and my practice have focused on understanding the toxicology and health risks associated with inadequately regulated toxic chemicals that are in our homes and schools, in our air, water, and food. I work extensively with communities who have been hurt by many of these chemicals. As chair of the Lexington Board of Health, I seek to use the best available information and science to improve the health of children and adults alike, including navigating the issue of turf fields. I serve on the EPA Toxic Substances Control Act Science Advisory Committee on Chemicals and the Massachusetts Toxics Use Reduction Act Science Advisory Board. My research is funded by the National Institutes of Health and Boston University. I have not been paid to participate, and I have no conflicts of, of interest to declare. Thank you. Thank you. All right, we're going to go now to Dr. Rachel Massey, who is joining us virtually. Hi, thank you. My name is Rachel Massey. I'm joining you today in my role as Senior Research Associate at the Lowell Center for Sustainable Production at UMass Lowell. My work is focused on occupational and environmental health policy and toxics use reduction. I don't have any conflicts of interest to declare. I have done several research projects on chemicals and other hazards related to artificial turf and on sustainably managed natural grass fields as a safer alternative. I completed most of this work while I was on staff at the Massachusetts Toxics Use Reduction Institute, which is a state entity and receives state funds. We also received funding for this work from the Heinz Endowments. The Lowell Center has also received an honorarium from the town of Arlington for my participation in this forum and the discussions leading up to it. And I also work currently for the Collaborative for Health and Environment. Okay. Thank you, Rachel. All right, um, back into the room. We're going to David Nardone. Can you hear me? Hi, I'm David Nardone. I'm a principal owner of Landscape Architect by training and I run my own consulting firm. I've been focused on athletic facility design for over 25 years. Um, I've worked with um, municipalities. My former um, job, I worked for the town of Arlington, Park and Rec, on, on a few projects. Um, I have worked with the Belmont Hill School for 25 years on all of their athletic facilities. Um, I've worked with Harvard and Penn and a lot of Ivy League institutions that have, you know, studied, studied turf internally. Um, I also uh, coach, I've coached lacrosse in my community for five years, a program with over 200 girls. The program would not exist without a mix of synthetic turf. Um, both privately owned and publicly um, owned as well. So thank you for having me here tonight. I'm not being paid or compensated for tonight. Thank you. 
And then last but not least, Jay Peters. Thank you. Can you hear me? Okay, okay. Uh, Jay Peters, I'm a principal risk assessor with Haley and Aldrich. Um, my role primarily involves evaluating how people can be exposed to chemicals at hazardous waste sites and what the nature of the health risk is that would be associated with that exposure. In my role, I work for real estate developers, energy companies, manufacturing companies primarily. Um, I recently worked um, on the uh, town of Lexington Lincoln Park uh, synthetic project. Um, I have no conflicts um, and I am being compensated to be here. Okay. Thank you. All right. So that was our introductions. <laughs> so now we're going to move into the first presentation, the what is artificial or synthetic turf. Again, this has been agreed to by both commissions, so we have one presenter on this, um, on this topic. Um, and so I'm going to turn it over to David Nardone. You have five minutes. Um, all right. So <clears throat> we just wanted to kind of do an overview on what the synthetic turf system is to try to get everybody on the same page. I mean, we've heard about, you know, infill and fibers and so on. So, you know, as several people have said tonight, it's really important to consider the site that you're, you know, proposing for synthetic turf. So the base, the drainage base listed at the bottom here and the stone and the the water, the arrows, the pipes, and so on. That should all be site-specific, you know, designed with a geotechnical engineer in, in consultation. Um, to to um, the drainage system can really be an asset to the site. It can handle stormwater besides the field. Um, it can slow down and, and contain in the the stormwater during a storm event to help any maybe off-site flooding, things like that. So it can really be an asset. Water can be collected for irrigation. There's a, a myriad of things that, that can happen with that um, drainage system. Um, above the drainage stone, there's a, a shock pad, a carpet, a turf infill carpet, and the infill itself. And we'll talk a little bit more about those details in the next few slides. So this is sort of zooming into that system that's on top of that drainage stone. The carpet is made out of, it's like an sh old shag carpet, anywhere from an inch and a half to two and a half inches long, depending on the type of system. And it has space to, um, you know, fill that with the infill. There is a, um, what we call a backing to that. So those fibers, just like a carpet in your house, that the fibers are sewn into a, are tufted, as they call it in, in, the, in the industry, into that backing. The backing is, is made out of a polypropylene, another um, plastic. And then there is what we call a secondary backing. It's basically, um, it's a, an adhesive to keep those fibers into the backing. So those are the three major components that make up the carpet, um, the fiber, the backing, and the secondary cut backing. In the infill, so you've heard about crumb rubber, you're gonna hear about some other things, maybe you've been on some fields that have other infills. All of those fields have sand in them. There are some systems out there that are like all rubber, but they don't perform well, they don't test well, they don't play well underfoot, not what we're looking for. Um, Jeff will talk a little bit more about that. So we're looking for sand in the system. Um, it weights the carpet down. It provides stability. Um, and generally, the rubber or other materials are on top of that sand layer. So the um, crumb rubber that you've heard about, you know, has been the most widely used infill, again, with sand. Um, you know, it's recycled car tires. Um, it's um, uh, very durable. That's why people like it. You know, it, um, you've, you've seen it does, it does move around, um, you know, under play and as to, you know, act like soil and, and, you know, grass plates moving around. There are other, um, what we call, um, they're either plastic base or rubber base, but they act a lot like the, the crumb rubber, so they're made out of uh, either thermoplastics or um, EPDM is the two major types of, of what we call, you know, virgin rubber, not, not from a recycled source, made 
um, into a polymer ground up and used as infill, so very similar size to the crumb rubber, and again, over sand. And they provide, you know, the same characteristics as that, as the, um, you know, the crumb rubber from a play standpoint. So all of the rubber products um, generally require less maintenance than the natural infill products. So um, it seems like over the last 10 to 15 years, these products have come onto the market, natural products. Um, they range from uh, coconut husk, uh, cork, sometimes those two are mixed together, sometimes they're not, um, wood chips, uh, coconut, uh, sorry, uh, walnut shells, um, and there are a few other uh, products out there that aren't as widely used, those are the most widely used ones. And below that carpet in infill is a shock pad. Is, um, so. Um, this is a shock pad made out of expanded polypropylene. Um, it's, um, you know, not a recycled product. It's a 100% recyclable, and it has a, you know, certification on it to be recycled. There are, just like the infill, there are other products you can buy. There's foams and rubbers that you can buy for shock pad, but you should think of all of these components as a system working together. So depending on what shock pad you have, maybe depend might. Um, affect how much sand and how much rubber you have in the system or natural materials. Okay, perfect timing. Thanks, David. Okay, so that's the what are we talking about. Um, we have a lot of other content to get to. Um, we're going to move now to the health and safety considerations about artificial turf. This is where we're going to kind of bifurcate our presentations and we'll hear in this instance first from the Conservation Commission and then uh, panelists and then from Parks and Recreation panelists. Um, we will start with Dr. Wendy Heiger, -Bernay no, Dr. Rachel Massey, and then we'll also hear from Dr. Uh, Wendy Heiger Bernays. Okay. So we're just going to pull up Rachel. Um, and we'll have six minutes total for this presentation. Okay. Um, I've been asked to cover three slides in three minutes, so <laughs> I will do my best. Um, so I can't see the slides, but I think the first slide that you, you can, have one there. One second, Rachel. We're just pulling um, them up, actually. Oh, oh, okay. Yeah, yeah. Sorry about that. There's multiple computers that are making this happen simultaneously. It's quite impressive. And many thanks to Jim. Okay, all right. We're gonna have you start while Jim gets the slides up. Okay, all right. Well, I believe the first slide you'll be looking at um, is a slide that just presents some key concepts. So the first one is just to note the particular vulnerability of children. Um, so children, as you probably all know, are more vulnerable than adults to certain hazards, including toxic chemicals. They breathe more air, drink more water, and eat more food per unit of body weight than adults. Their organ systems are developing rapidly, and their behaviors can increase likelihood of exposure to chemicals in their surroundings. And a toxic exposure that occurs during a key window of, sus of susceptibility can have lifelong consequences. This slide also shows you some key vocabulary words hazard, exposure, and risk. So when we talk about chemicals, hazard is an inherent property of a chemical. For example, carcinogenicity is, a, is an inherent hazard of certain chemicals. Exposure is a um, measure of how much you're exposed to, whether it's through skin, inhalation, or ingestion. And then risk is a concept that brings together both hazard and exposure. So risk is a concept that basically is an estimate of the excess disease burden that will result from exposure to certain hazards. And in uh, so risk assessments build in a variety of assumptions about how a chemical is absorbed, the number of hours or years that you're exposed to, the life stage at which that exposure occurs, and so forth. Um, so these are just some helpful things to have in mind, and I'll just go to the next slide since we need to be quick. Um, okay, so, so this next slide um, gives you some information on chemicals in infills. As you've already heard, um, tire crumb or waste tire material is often used as, um, as infill. Okay, now I can't see the slides anymore. Um, uh, okay. Um, 
So um, an EPA literature review that was done on tire crumb a number of years ago found more than 350 chemicals in the material. Examples include heavy metals such as lead and zinc, polyaromatic hydrocarbons or PAHs, volatile and semi-volatile organic compounds, um, including chemicals such as polychlorinated uh, biphenyls or PCBs. An emerging issue is um, 6-PPD, which is an anti-ozonant used in tires, and the transformation product, 6-PPD quinone, is very toxic to certain fish. And there are also emerging data on, from biomonitoring finding um, that chemical in human tissues. I think I don't have time to go into the other infill materials, but um, just briefly, the, from the research that my colleagues and I have done, we were not able to find any alternative infill that was entirely free of concerns, although many of them do contain either uh, lower concentrations or smaller numbers of the toxic chemicals found in tire crumb. And happy to go into that more in the Q&A. All of this is complicated by the lack of disclosure, so we generally are not provided with information from the manufacturers and vendors about exactly what's in these products. Um, next slide. So uh, this just is a visual showing you a little bit more about tires. So you see waste tires at the top and then a facility that converts waste tires into tire shreds or tire crumb. And at the bottom, a photo from the Conservation Commission of tire crumb on snow. I think that's my three minutes and I'm happy to talk about all of this more later. Okay, we'll move on to the next Move on to the next slide. Um, so much has been made um, about this question of PFAS. Recent analysis by public interest researchers have demonstrated the use and or presence of PFAS chemicals uh, in parts, certainly parts of the, the blades, the pads, and the backing that you heard about. A little bit about PFAS. It's a large class of chemicals and there is broad scientific consensus that PFAS are mobile in the environment. They don't break down or go away. They accumulate in our bodies and they are toxic. There is robust scientific evidence that the ones that have been studied are linked to cancers, immune dysfunction, including poor response to vaccines, Cardiovascular thyroid effects, and the list goes on, but the one that my group is studying uh, is liver damage and changes in lipid levels, including elevation of cholesterol. There are many PFAS. Only six of the 12,000 or so are regulated in Massachusetts. Some of the seemingly less toxic forms that you may hear about later, also called precursors, can rearrange in the environment to reform the really toxic forms, including a couple of the six that are already regulated. Testing only for these six will result in turf that contains little or no PFAS. Using laboratory methods that are more sensitive allows us to see that PFAS are present in turf samples, and they show that some of the PFAS chemicals migrate off the field, and my colleague, Ms. Chapnick, will share some of those data. There are no PFAS-free fields right now. If a supplier tells you that they are sourcing PFAS-free manufacturing systems, please ask them for their definition of PFAS. Next slide, please. In addition, heat. There is evidence, in addition to heat, there's, there is evidence for frequent and more severe abrasions from artificial turf than from natural turf. See your children's knees, and for those adults who play, you know this better than I. For any of you who have played or walked on artificial turf, you know that there's no question that artificial turf gets hotter than natural turf. On the slide, you see two panels. The top shows artificial turf on the right and the natural grass on the left of the grate. Using a technique that measures the heat coming off the fields, the natural grass radiates very little heat, that's shown in blue, and the artificial turf radiates large amounts of heat, as shown in red. In fact, at 85 degrees ambient temperature, the turf measured 155 degrees. So why is heat a concern? Because of heat-related illnesses namely hydration, dehydration, heat stress, and heat stroke. And over 240 million Americans are prescribed medications which increase their susceptibility to heat. These medications can alter the body's thermoregulatory response. Many, next slide please. 
Many communities are recognizing and addressing the impacts of artificial turf. Burlington has placed policies for limiting playing in, in heat. You will hear that wet bulb determination of temperature at chest height is a more reliable metric than taking the ambient surface temperature. However, the surface temperature better reflects the actual temperatures to which children and others are exposed. I'll note that several boards of health have also made recommendations to avoid installation of artificial turf. Some boards of health, as you've heard tonight, have stated the importance of playing fields. Playing fields are important, and the importance of decreasing health risks associated with those fields. Thank you. Okay. All right. Um, so now we're going to move to the Parks and Recreation Commission panelists, um, and we have Jeff and Laura speaking. Uh, to this. I'm not sure in which order. Uh, I'm gonna oh, yeah. all right. <coughs> so can Never you, mind. Can we you have go Jay. Back to the slide on the chrome rubber. Uh, right there. Uh, yep, yeah, right there. So, so this is a great slide. I mean, it, it does identify what's in chrome rubber, right? There are many chemicals in chrome rubber. Closer. What? Closer to your mouth. Oh, okay. Oh, it's off. Oh, or that. Sorry about that. It's off. It's off. All right. So um, this slide is, right, it illustrates the chemicals that are in chrome rubber, and the fact of the matter is there's chemicals in everything that's made out of plastic and rubber in our homes and our cars and our schools and so forth. Um, the, the question is, you know, how do people get exposed to those chemicals in chrome rubber on a turf field? So if we think about, you know, how do we get exposed to something on a turf field, you know, it's really contacting the infill material, getting it stuck on our skin, or accidentally ingesting it, right? And that goes for whether the infill is crumb rubber, a natural material, or soil on a natural turf field. Um, and so studies performed by US EPA, as well as a number of researchers, have shown that the chemical, the amount of chemical that can come out of crumb rubber is not enough to actually harm people through those exposure pathways that I mentioned. Um, next slide. Uh, and then one more, uh, yep, yeah. so, so one of the reasons PFAS came into the news and on the internet and stuff with its association with synthetic turf fields is because um, community groups and others have, have sampled turf that's actually in place and they've analyzed it for PFAS, right? Well, the, the reality is that PFAS exists as a background condition everywhere. It's in the air, it's in the rainwater, and it's in the soil. So if turf is sitting there collecting rainwater, it will eventually get PFAS in it and you'll be able to detect it, right? And we know it's a background condition because the states of Vermont and Maine have done extensive soil studies across their entire state and have showed that PFAS is in every single soil sample, including in very remote background areas. And the same can be said of, um, of groundwater and surface water. Now I'm gonna turn it over to our next presenter. Hello. Synthetic turf testing. Really, there's hundreds of tests to evaluate a synthetic turf system. But today, we're going to focus on player interactions and ball interactions at the surface. Okay. What parameters are we looking at? How do we evaluate in the surface? We're looking at how the head interacts with the surface. We're looking at the stability of the surface, the way the athlete walks and plays on it. And we're looking at the way the ball interacts with the surface. We have a few test methods that we'll speak about. Still back in the last slide, real quick. Or we can leave it on here, it's fine. <laughs> we have a lot of test methods that we'll talk about briefly to help evaluating these surfaces. But the reality is we have to think about where these tolerances come from. And the tolerances are chosen by sport. So when we test an artificial field for force reduction or head injury or, or one of these things that we're going to talk about, the tolerances, tolerances are defined by the sport, not the surface. The equipment doesn't care what surface we're testing on. It cares about the result we're getting out of it. Head surface interaction. You know, why do we care about this? This is a way to predict head injuries. There's a number of different ways to evaluate head injury on these sports surfaces either by fixed fall heights or establishing critical fall heights. We have Consumer Safety Product Commission to tell us when we've reached that point or we've introduced the chance of the fatality. 
in a fall. So we look at head injury as a pretty important factor, as we all can imagine. So there's a lot of ways to evaluate it. Like I said, we won't get into the details of it, but we're looking at it at, at a no, number of different angles, a number of different weights, and different heights. Can you go to the next slide, please? Underfoot interaction. You know, when we talk about head injury before, it makes pretty simple sense. We could have a real big soft surface, we could like a playground, we can fall from a high fall height. But the reality is we want to have stability in our surface too. We want to be able to mimic a natural field is the idea here. We want the same hardness of the surface as we do with the natural field. We want the same deformation of the surface, you know, how much the surface is going to press underneath the athlete's foot. We want the same energy restitution of the surface, how much energy is put back into the athlete. You know, all these parameters, again, are decided by the ideal surface for whatever sport we're representing at that time. Rotational resistance is another example here. We're measuring the rotational forces on the surface, cutting, change of direction. Um, all these things help us evaluate the field, the speed of the field, you know, how fast the athletes move there, how fast is the ball going to, you know, ride on this field, how long is it going to go. Go to one more here. I'll try to go quick with you know, that ball interaction tells us a lot about the surface as well. You know, we talked about our head injuries, the stability, but we also want that ball to play the same way as a natural surface. Again, that's what we're mimicking here. You know, so we look at both surfaces the same. Both are subject to the same tolerances. Both surfaces should have the same safety requirements that we play on. And really, the one key difference here is, you know, how often we have to test for these parameters. You know, and then, you know, we talked to her a little bit earlier about my FIFA certification. We do a FIFA certified field or a rugby certified field or a hockey certified field. There's a given timeline of certification, one to four years, depending on what it is, all the way in between. On a natural field, when we test a natural field for, you know, same situation, a FIFA natural certification, that lasts for one day. And it's about the variability of the surface, you know, the, the environmental conditions that can affect how that surface plays. And on an artificial surface, we can have a little bit more predictability. We know that moisture is less of an effect, temperature is less of an effect of how that surface plays. So that timing is important. I think we'll probably stop there to get Laura in for the end. If we're running close I'm afraid time. we have about 15 seconds for yeah, Laura sorry. at this point. <laughs> oh, okay. Well, um, next slide then. Um, is the slide for uh, protecting players' health during summertime conditions up? Nope, that's not it. Nope, go back. Yep, 15 oh. seconds, Laura. Okay. Uh, all right, let's read together real fast. Protecting players' health during summertime, by which I mean July and August. Uh, first, follow guidelines set by the Massachusetts Interscholastic Athletic Association. I gave you the website here. Uh, the MIAA has a medical committee made up of doctors, nurses, and trainers, uh, and their recommendations should be followed to the letter. What they recommend, not what I recommend, what they recommend is to measure and make decision best based on the wet bulb globe temperature. This measurement, the wet bulb, bulb globe temperature, accounts not only for temperature, but also for humidity, for solar radiation, and for wind speed. Okay, Laura, Everyone I'm sorry, I'm gonna have to stop you there. Well, I'm sorry, but I really just need to finish this slide. I don't think it's too much to ask. No. I'll, I, I'm, I think people can read it, but we do have to move on. Okay. okay. So now we're moving on to the environmental considerations around artificial turf. We can, we'll, we can leave it up for 15 seconds, yeah. I think it's an important point, so I hope everyone reads it, please. <laughs> okay. Um, as a reminder, there will be a two-minute um, opportunity for each commission to respond to the presentation, to share a final thought, or perhaps to read this bullet. Okay. Um, we're going to move on to environmental considerations, and on this one, we're going to uh, start with the Parks and Rec Commission. Um, you have three minutes total for all people that speak. All right. Um, I... Thank you. Uh, I'll be quick on this um, to make sure the public has enough opportunity to ask questions later. So um, this is really about sustainability 
uh, with synthetic turf systems. So, first of all, there's been some misinformation out there that um, synthetic turf systems are um, impermeable. Uh, that is not correct. They drain vertically, therefore they improve groundwater recharge and provide stormwater benefits. Um, Jeff does a lot of testing on this and the stone bases, most specifications are written so they have to drain at least 10 inches per hour. You will never get that on a natural grass field, let alone our natural grass fields. Um, there's no fertilizer required, no her herbicides or pesticides required on a synthetic turf field. There's no irrigation required on a synthetic turf field. It drastically reduces the maintenance requirements, uh, which is a huge benefit to the town and our limited budget. Um, from rubber infill, a lot of people like to make negative comments about, but this is a recycled material, which diverts millions of car tires from landfills. So without crumb rubber, those are going back into a landfill. Um, so it is a repurposed material. All the natural infills are sustainably harvested. And, um, you know, a lot of different communities and institutions are using both pro um, both infills, so it is a sustainable uh, solution to fields. Great, we're making up time. Um, all right, we're going to go to the Conservation Commission. Susan Chapnick, oh, three minutes. Thank you. Um, can you hear me? Okay, great. In Arlington, we have wetland resource areas on parts of artificial turf fields or directly adjacent to them, including the Arlington Catholic High School field on Summer Street and the permitted Arlington High School field, which is not yet built. We also have natural grass fields near or in resource areas, including Herd Field, Thorndike Field, and McLennan Park. Chemical hazards escape from artificial turf surfaces to the environment. We've talked about a number of chemicals that can come off these fields. These chemicals can leach to contaminate surface waters, groundwaters, and soil. Other chemicals actually migrate with the particles themselves. The same chemicals discussed by Dr. Massey, including metals, PAHs, and PFAS are also harmful to the environment. PFAS has been documented to leach from artificial turf fields. There's a rec recent 2021 study of Amity High School turf field in Woodbridge, Connecticut. The data, the samples were analyzed by York Analytical Lab, which is a certified lab using EPA PFAS methods and all the QAQC to show the methods and result validity and showed um, PFAS leaching from these fields during a rain event. I have to take um, uh, exception to the prior panelists' mention of using herbicides and pesticides as a problem on natural fields that can be mitigated by using organic turf management that has been done in Marblehead and Springfield. A typical 80,000 square foot athletic field places 80,000 square feet of plastic in the environment. Plastic is not habitat. Loss of habitat, loss of wildlife corridor connectivity. Extreme surface heat negatively impacts resource area values, and there are hazards from migration of artificial turf components off the field, including plastic pollution and microplastic pollution. Next slide, please. Management of infill migration was not performed routinely for the Arlington Catholic High School field which was installed 12 years ago. You can see in these pictures migration of the infill off the field into a resource area near Millbrook and also into the perimeter drains. The Conservation Commission is issued an enforcement letter to Arlington Catholic and Arlington Catholic has cleaned up this infill. We did a site visit last week to confirm that. And they are working with the Conservation Commission to develop a monitoring plan to make sure that this doesn't happen again. Next slide, please. Why am I showing you pictures of Millbrook on the left and fish on the right? Because Millbrook is an important aquatic resource in our town, and River Herring, which that is a picture of, swim upstream and spawn at the base of the waterfall in Cook's Hollow within 100 feet 
of an artificial turf field. Scientific studies have documented toxicity from zinc to aquatic organisms. I agree with a statement made by Dr. Laura Green at the January 5th Conservation Commission public hearing where she said, when infill is road tires, it contains zinc. Zinc is toxic to fish. We have recently published scientific information from 2022 that also shows that 6-PPD quinone, as previously shared by Dr. Massey, is acutely toxic to fish, including rainbow trout and brook trout. That means it causes fish kills. Susan, I'm going to have to ask you to end there. Okay, thank okay. you. Thank you. Okay, um, we're now moving on to sustainability. Um, and we're going to start this time with, again, Conservation Commission panelist, Susan Chapnick. Three minutes. Okay. <laughs> you know, I used to talk really fast because I'm from New York, but I've been displaced so long that I don't talk that fast anymore. Okay, sustainability and climate impacts. Current evidence shows that artificial turf cannot be meaningfully recycled. The Synthetic Turf Council Guide to Recycle, Reuse, Repurpose, and Remove Synthetic Turf Systems from 2017, which I believe David Dardone contributed to, states that, and I quote, the carbon footprint of a particular recycling end-of-life option, such as trucking long distances, may be integrated into the decision-making process and lead responsible parties to invalidate such an option. It is important to investigate all recycling and reuse options in the region before choosing to landfill. There are currently no recycling plants in the Northeast for artificial turf fields. Residents of Arlington and the town have been very focused on climate and energy. Artificial turf contributes to the climate crisis throughout its life cycle, requiring fossil fuels during production and emitting greenhouse gases during use and disposal. Additionally, the town has adopted initiatives to reduce plastic consumption. I'm sure you're all aware of the single-use bottle bans, single single-use plastic bans, and most recently for an EcoFest campaign with the slogan, No Plastic, Please. According to the Synthetic Turf Council, one 80,000 square foot athletic field uses 200 tons. That's 400,000 pounds of infill and has 20 tons of turf carpet. Additionally, turf fields are not consistent with sustainability principles in that they have a limited lifespan of approximately 10 years, at which time they need to be disposed of and replaced. Next slide, please. Artificial turf fields exacerbate heat stress in already stressed areas of town. This uh, picture on the right is from the Arlington Hazard Mitigation Plan. The hot pink areas are the hottest 5% of our town's areas. Most of them, as you may expect, are clustered around Massachusetts Avenue, which bisects the town, and in the heavily populated East Arlington. However, you might notice there's a small pink cluster on the lower left-hand corner of our town. That actually is the area of St. Camillus Land. It also has a pump station there and Poets Corner. So this area is already a hotspot in Arlington. Many of these hotspots are in EJ environmental justice communities, including Poets Corner. Current data from the National Weather Service show that we will lose 21 days of playing time if we close artificial turf fields when the air temperature is 90 degrees, which is what Burlington does for health and safety. This should be considered in weighing the increase in additional playing time on wet fields. Artificial turf also results in the loss of green space and the loss of the opportunity of using vegetated surfaces as a carbon sink. For climate mitigation. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, great. Thanks, Susan. Um, and now we're going to Parks and Recreation Commission panelists. I believe Laura and Dr. Er. Jay. Um, so, just on recycling turf, this is um, one example. Uh, many of the manufacturers have, you know, developed programs over the last several years. This is from Shaw Sports Turf. 
Um, they're touting, um, you know, their program here. They've, um, you know, recycled um, to date over five million pounds of turf. Um, they've manufactured over three and a half million square feet of their, what they call their next pad. So they make a shock pad now and half of that shock pad is made up of recycled synthetic turf. Um, that's saved over 75,000 cubic yards of landfill space um, and saved over uh, 14 million kilowatt hours. That's what the diagram on the right um, refers to. Um, there are several other companies that have also implemented programs. Um, Tenkata, which is one of the largest fiber manufacturers, is working with ExxonMobil. Um, I will actually recycle several um, fields for a client this year in Pennsylvania with APW Enterprises. Um, and so, you know, the industry is, is clearly moving in this direction. Yeah, if I could just add as part of David's time, um, there's also uh, several companies that recycle turf into plastic lumber materials as well. Um, so it is being recycled. All right. Um, and with that, we are going to hear some closing statements or opportunities to respond to something that was in the other presentation. Um, or perhaps expand upon something that the panelists were unable to get to in their time. Um, we're going to have two minutes for each commission, and we're going to start with Parks and Rec. Thank you. Uh, the Park and Recreation Commission would like to thank you for your participation at this forum. We hope that you have found it informative. In closing, where's my slide? There we go. In closing, all sports fields have their pros and cons. Based on independent peer review studies provided by our experts, along with their guidance, we believe synthetic turf fields are safe and provide the best option for our athletes and our community. Site-specific con considerations should always predominate. All projects should be reviewed on a case-by-case -case basis. This is why the select board took no action on the Article 12 moratorium. Stakeholders should always be involved in decision making. We as a commission are constantly asking ourselves, how can we better meet the needs for the users? Letters of support for the use of turf and redevelopment of poets have been jointly submitted by Arlington Soccer Club, Arlington Youth Lacrosse, and Arlington Youth Baseball and Softball Association. We hope that town meeting members will take this into consideration. Stakeholders are student athletes, coaches, town administrators, school administrators, parents. We are not the first community to explore the use of synthetic turf fields. Many others have and have come to the same conclusion. They are safe. Belmont, Waltham, Lexington, Winchester, Medford, and Somerville all have them and continue to build them. Major institutions like Harvard, BC, MIT, Northeastern, and UMass all have them and continue to build them. Do you think they would do that if they were an environmental or human health risk? So I ask you, why not us? The time is now. Thank you. Okay. We're going to move along. All right. We are moving along, and we will now hear from the Conservation Commission, Dr. Wendy Heiger Bernays. Hey, can you put up our first slide, um, please? All the way. All the way to the beginning. Yeah. <laughs> Or if you can't, that's okay. We don't want to lose time. Oh, okay. Yep. Thank you. Um, we're here this evening not to sell you a product, but to share our understanding of the health, safety, and environmental impacts of artificial fields using the most up-to-date scientific data. We believe 
that Arlington residents and town meeting members are smart and can see right through the folksy assurances that have been made about artificial turf. You've not been provided the full picture of the issues. The issues that we raised are concerning to us, which is why we bring them to you. We're not telling you what to do. We are asking you to consider the fact that you will be making decisions for your families, for your children, and for your neighbor's children. As smart consumers, we suggest that you consider all of the information that you hear. To consider the, that science has come quite far in allowing us to answer some previously unanswered questions. We suggest that a comparison with well-maintained, sustainably managed or organic natural turf, grass, may decrease some of your concerns. I would like to point out that the current risk assessments that have been cited and discussed only look at the hours or days spent exposed to the materials in the fields. But this does not account for the full daily exposures to get the full and true health risk. So we thank you for your time. We look forward to answering your questions and thank you for this opportunity. All right, thank you panelists. Um, as you hopefully heard that there, there are some points where these panelists agree and also many where they, where they disagree. Um, also, you probably can imagine that this information they presented is a subset of all that they know and all that could be discussed on artificial turf. And I'm sure you've noticed that we've given them a very short time to only cover key points, um, which brings us into our question and answer session. Um, we want to give you the opportunity to ask these panelists questions that they did not speak to or something that they spoke to that you want clarified. Um, we really encourage you to ask curious and clarifying questions and not statements that are masquerading as questions. You will have time for statements at the town meeting and you will have time for statements when you talk with the commissions and attend their meetings. This is to clarify questions for the panelists. Um, I'm going to explain the Q&A process one more time. Um, it's a little um, odd, perhaps. So basically, you have the chance to enter a lottery to share your question. We can't get to everyone's questions tonight. Um, you can either choose to share a question orally. And if you would like to do that, um, on the note card that was on your seat, you can write your name. And then you'll, we'll have a few minutes break, so don't do it now, but you can then place the note card with your name in either a bin up here labeled or a bin in the back labeled. And we'll have Joe and David standing at each of those tables to help out. You will have one minute to ask a question if you ask it orally, one minute. If you would like to enter the run, running or a lottery to share a written question on your note card that was on your seat, please write your written just write out the question and then we'll read it aloud. Um, in both of these cases, we'll then randomly pull from the bins and ask the question. Um, and then we'll alternate between written and oral questions. Um, all, unwritten, all unanswered written questions will be listed in the forum summary that will be shared so you can see what everyone was going to ask. Um, again, we are inviting only Arlington residents to ask questions. In terms of responses, each commission will get one minute to respond to the question. Um, if you want multiple responders, please be aware that you only have one minute total. Um, okay, so we're gonna take about three minutes right now to write your questions and to place them in the bins. Um, we'll have Joe and David in the back um, monitoring. And if you need a note card, um, please let one of us know. All right, three minutes.
Okay, we have a one minute, so final call for questions. Okay, if everyone can take their seats, we'll stop this question and answer period. Uh, can we get David to bring up the questions from the rear? David, we're going to ask you to bring up the questions from the rear of the room. All right, we're going to go ahead and get started here. If we could have everyone take their seats. All right. We're going to go ahead and get started on the Q&A portion of this forum. If you can't hear me say your name, you won't know if you're called on to share your question. I thought that would incentivize them. 
Yeah, we have a lot of sports whistlers, right? <laughs> All right, we're going to go ahead and get started. <laughs> All right, group effort here. Thank you. Um, okay, so we now have combined our bins from the rear and the side of the room. Um, before we get started, just some quick, quick ground rules. Um, please be concise and stick to the time limits if you're sharing a question orally. It's one minute per question and one minute for each commission to answer. Um, we're trying to get to as many questions as possible. That's been a key goal of the planning team and the two commissions tonight, so we're really going to be tight on our timing. Um, and then lastly, just please be respectful towards each other and do not speak to others in ways you yourself wouldn't want to be spoken to. You're all our neighbors. Um, this is a community. Okay. Um, so what we're going to do is we're going to start with a written question. Um, so I'm going to just pull one now, but I'll also pull the first oral question um, just so you know that it's coming for you. If you just could raise your hand, Joe is going to come and run the mic to you. Um, but first, again, we'll do the written question and then we'll go to the oral. Okay, so the first oral question, which will happen after the first written question, is for Tyler Short. So if Tyler, okay, so we see Tyler, Joe will bring it over and we'll um, come to you after the written question. So the first written question um, will be, to what extent has or will the existence of wetlands on the archdiocese parcel um, on, on the, Decision. Design. design. Oh, looks that like. makes a lot more sense. On the design. So to what extent has or will the existence of wetlands on the archdiocese parcel, my guess is, affect the design? Um, and we're, we will start with um, Parks and Rec, and then we'll go to Conservation Commission. Okay. Um, I can start with that. Um, so... Belmont Hill School submitted a um, RDA, David? It's an ANRAD. An ANRAD uh, for delineation of the wetlands that currently exist on site. So the plans as they stand right now are just preliminary. They're schematic plans. Um, so we're having the, the wetlands have been delineated and they're being reviewed by the Conservation Commission. And that's all part of the permitting and engineering and design process as things move forward. So, anything to add, Dave? No, I think it's to be determined. Yep. Okay. Uh, I'll figure that out. Okay, we're going to go to Conservation Commission to answer this. Okay, so the Conservation Commission has this, this ANRAD, which is an abbreviated notice of resource area delineation for the Poets' Corner area. Um, preliminarily, there were two uh, isolated wetlands um, shown by the applicant, which is Belmont Hill. Uh, the Conservation Commission is reviewing the information and, ha and is uh, planning on getting a peer review of this, this delineation. As the delineation was performed last year, if everybody remembers, we were in a drought at that time. Um, and we are going to be looking for any uh, resource areas uh, on the parcel. So once that is established, then the Conservation Commission will make a determination of the um, resource areas on that parcel. And then after that, if there is a notice of intent for a specific project in this area from Belmont Hill, that includes artificial turf fields or anything season. else, we, we, it will come to the commission for a hearing and a vote. Okay, thank you. Okay, so next we're gonna go to Tyler Short for your um, question. Yep, thanks. Uh, so my question is, what's the, um, how does the toxicity of a artificial turf field compare to the toxicity of the soil that exists today in Arlington, or towns like Arlington? 
Okay, I'm going to go to Dr. Wait, sorry, we're going to start with Conservation oh. Commission on this one. And sure. Then Um, I think that the, the question, the, just, oh, sorry. Hmm. So you may have heard a statement that artificial turf is cleaner than dirt. Um, there are contaminants, there are materials in soil. They can be well characterized. Um, they are there regardless of whether the turf is there or not. When one adds the turf, one adds the contaminants, right? And so we have a suite of contaminants there currently and a suite there that will be added without, uh, and the question is, do you really want to add more toxic materials? I don't, thank you. Oh, you have 15 more seconds. Sorry, that was a signal. <laughs> so the, including the plastic, and so, <laughs> the absolute toxicity, the hazard, the hazard with some of these chemicals, such as the PAHs, increases over time with the weathering, as does the PFAS. Other chemicals don't change in their toxicity with the weathering. Time's up. <laughs> okay, so now we'll go to Parks and Rec Commission. Yeah, I'll pass it over to Dr. Green. Okay. Oh, great, thank you very much. Um, great question. Um, and with all respect to Dr. Wendy Hydrobin, uh, whom I do have great respect for, she's incorrect. When you install an artificial turf field, you remove the grass. In fact, you dig down, David Nardone, correct me if I'm wrong, you dig down about 18 inches. You just remove all of this, all of the topsoil, all of the grass, because as David showed, it's a multi-layer system. You have to dig down about a foot and a half to lay the gravel, base, all the other materials. So that's the first thing. It's not additive, it's subtractive, number one. Number two, we did exactly this analysis at Martha's Vineyard, a project I worked on about two years ago. We extensively analyzed the existing topsoil at the Martha's Vineyard Regional High School. We analyzed it for heavy metals, and of course it contained lead and arsenic and cadmium. We analyzed it for the PFAS-6, regulated in Massachusetts, and it contained 900 parts per trillion of PFOS, 300 parts per trillion of PFOA, and lower but detectable levels of the other four regulated PFAS in Massachusetts. All right, and Laura, that's time. Thank you. I, I didn't get to answer the full question. May I please have a little more time, especially since I had basically 20 seconds beforehand? I'm, I'm sorry, Dr. Green. We really do need to be um, brief but on But I was time. not able to answer the gentleman's question. I don't think it's fair to him. Your rules, it's okay with me. Okay, we'll give you 15 more seconds if you can please keep it brief. Then, then we get 15 more seconds for rebuttal. Okay, and then that's it, okay? This is what happens when you extend time limits, okay? All right, Never 15 mind. seconds Never for each. Mind. Never mind. Okay, great. We're moving on then. So, we have two more questions. Um, so, we're going to do the written first and then the oral. Um, the oral one, though, will be Jordan Weinstein. We have a hand here, so we know where. All right, but we're going to start with the written question. Can you clarify the slide with Poets Land Parcel? Are we talking about converting all land into artificial turf? Is there a proposed field layout for us to consider? So this one, we'll start with Parks and Rec. Sure. Um, this forum is not about the Poets Corner Project. I want to make that clear. The intent of this forum was to discuss the pros and cons of turf. All information related to the Poets Corner Project are, is available on our website, on the Recreation Department website. There are 3D renderings of what the proposal is um, and potentially could be. There's plan views. Um, from multiple different angles of the fields, of the walking trails, of the playground, uh, of the basketball courts. So you can see all that. We've had three public meetings about the project where we've showed um, the plans and the renderings, so that's all available. It is not the entire church parcel, and in fact, um, much of the open space is being preserved as woodland. Thank you, Phil. All right, uh, Conservation Commission. Hi, um, I I can't I can't speak to uh, what Park and Rec is planning on doing, except for the fact that I was at the third um, public meeting 
for um, the proposed fields, and the proposal included two artificial turf fields, once one field covering the existing Poets' Corner field, which is the smaller field closer to Route 2, and a much larger field that extends back towards the uh, woodland and wetland areas um, and over on the St. Camilla's parking lot. So there is an extensive amount of artificial turf proposed. Um, in the proposal, there is also some restoration of the woodland and park area. And again, we don't know exactly where the wetland resource areas are on this site. Thank you. Thanks. All right, we're going now to Jordan. Excuse me? Thank you. Uh, this question has to do with uh, transparency and also a big elephant that's in the room that people are not paying attention to right now. The chairman of the Park and Recreation Commission, who's sitting among you right now, is the senior project manager at David White & Sons, which specializes in- This is not relevant. Abby, please stop. Sports. We're gonna let, the, we're gonna let. Excuse me, I have a right to, we're, I have a right to ask this question. You have, you have 30 seconds. Which specializes in the design, sale, and installation of sports fields. My question Correct. is, shouldn't he be asked to recu recuse himself from any decision making or policy making when it comes to artificial turf in Arlington in order to reduce the appearance of a conflict of interest? You, you can refer okay. that and question. That's a legitimate question. You, you can refer that question to Doug Heim, who I have consulted with about this. So yeah. we're, okay, we're gonna do our panel questions. Phil, if you wanna respond to yeah. this, you can, or we can have someone from the oh, town. Oh, I would, I would love to respond to this. I, like any other volunteer in any other border commission, is acting as a professional to provide professional guidance and advice to the community. So there are architects on the historic commission there are toxicologists on the Conservation Commission. So if you want to question me about my professional ethics, why don't you question them as well, okay? And I have consulted with Doug Heim, town council, about this, and there is no conflict. And let me tell you too, Jordan, why I volunteer. I volunteer for my kids. My parents were volunteers. They're in their 80s, and they still volunteer. And I want to show my kids that this is a responsibility to my community, okay? Okay, we're now gonna have... Okay, thank you. We're now going to have a, a one minute... Okay, we're now going to have a one minute comment from our town manager. I'll make it 30 seconds, thank you. I just want to say that um, I want to affirm that we have reviewed uh, with town council. Town council has announced that there is not a conflict, so it's great for you to say it, but I think you should hear somebody from the town re reaffirming that. Thank you very much. All right, two uh, more questions. I Can I respond? Yes, yeah, sorry. Okay, obviously I have no comment on your conflict of interest. However, I, I will say that we have It's no not a conflict of interest, the town manager has just said that. I, I, just, I just said I have no comment. <laughs> I, I, but we have no toxicologists on the Conservation Commission, just FYI. And we are very concerned on the Conservation Commission with any perception of conflict of interest. And so I will divulge that we have been asked to bring Article 12 um, substitute motion to the Conservation Commission for a vote. We have decided not to do that because of the perception of a conflict of interest given the fact that we have this ANRAD hearing before the Commission right now from Belmont Hill School. I will also correct the record while I have 10 seconds to say that Belmont High School proposal for artificial turf field was voted down by the town. 
So it is a misstatement that that is going in. It's going to be a grass, grass fields at the Belmont High something. School. Thank you. Okay. All right. All right, moving right along. So we have two questions, written one first, but the oral one will be from Winnell Evans. So a hand up, so Joe knows. Okay, um, but first we'll do the written. What will our study of turf discover that our neighboring towns didn't know when they installed turf? Why do we think we will learn anything new? Okay, and so now we're starting with Conservation Commission, um, and then we'll go to Parks and Rec. Um, Rachel, are I'm, you available? Sure, yeah. Okay. Um, I can just be quick. Um, I would say, um, so in my experience, many communities have been researching these issues and there has, um, I guess, as the years have gone along, the concerns have increased rather than decreased. Um, so, yeah, I guess from my standpoint, I see lots of concerns from many communities. Um, and I hear from a lot of parents who are concerned about their children being exposed to artificial turf. Um, but maybe I think that's all I have to say. I don't know if, Wendy, you want to say more? 30 seconds if you want to add. Um, I think it comes down to, it often comes down to having uh, incomplete information as to what one compares the artificial turf with. I think that the right comparison is a well-maintained natural turf field. Um, and so I think it does come down to the way the data, the information, the cost estimates are provided. Thank you. Thank you. All right. And so we're going to Winnell. Winnell, apologies if I'm pronouncing it wrong. So. Oh, I'm sorry. <laughs> really jumping the gun over here. Okay. So the question is, what will we find different now that we haven't? What will our study of turf discover that our neighboring towns didn't know when they installed turf? Why do we think we will learn anything new? Well, I can tell you that Lexington just did a study, um, which the doctor over there was part of, and they approved the use of the fields. That was just approved at town meeting um, within a month or so ago. Belmont High School did a study and approved the use of a um, synthetic turf field as part of their high school project. They already had one at the track and field, and they just put another one in with a uh, natural infill. So these fields are being studied continuously. We're not going to find anything different than our neighboring communities have. They're safe. That's why they're installing them. Okay. Thank you. Um, I, what I'll do is I'm going to add, why don't we do two minutes at the end of um, Q&A for people to respond. Um, at, like at the end of the total okay. All right, <laughs> back to where we were. Um, one minute. Thank you, Winnell Evans. Um, I'm not really sure who to direct this question to, maybe either to Park and Recreation or possibly to Mr. Pooler. My question is about liability. Um, 3M has recently said that they are gonna start phasing out production with PFAS chemicals. A citizen group in North Carolina has petitioned the UN to sue Kimors for human rights violations. Lawsuits are cropping up all around the country. Insurers are now declining to insure for PFAS. So my question is, how is the town going to handle um, a lawsuit if we have already gone ahead and installed another artificial turf field and it either becomes, you know, through regulation, um, no longer allowed, or there is either a personal liability or a class action lawsuit. How will that be handled? Thank you. Okay. Town question. Thank you. Um, so I won't have to make a decision about whether we put in turf fields or not, but if I did, I would want to make a recommendation that any kind of field we put into Arlington would meet safety standards. Uh, that's what we're doing with the high school, for example. Uh, when the Conservation Commission recommended that we go, uh, that approved the installation of a field at the high school, there were certain standards that, that field has to meet. It, it still has to pass those tests. Um, 
I can't speak to what would happen 20 years from now if, you know, things, we find out something is, is more dangerous than we know today. That obviously is a possibility. On the other hand, I think what we try to do is make our best guess now based on scientific evidence and, uh, and then approve what we think would be a safe field. Um, may I please add something? So we can, we can go to the commissions. Um, so last time we heard, I think we go to Conservation Commission first this time. Thank you. I can't speak to the legal aspects, but I can speak to the permitted field at the Arlington High School that has not yet been installed. There are indeed um, strict testing requirements that were put in the permit back in 2020. However, there's new science. I presented new science, and so did Dr. Massey, about 6-PPD quinone, which was discovered in 2022 to be directly toxic to fish. That information was not known when we permitted the field. So science does change, and the testing that is being done for the artificial turf field at the high school does not include this chemical. This chemical is not in any standard ASTM tests or EPA tests or Massachusetts required tests for soil. And that's time. Perfect. Thanks, Ethan. Okay. I'll pass my time off to Dr. Green. Um, thanks very much. That was an excellent question from the audience. Um, I think it's based on a misunderstanding, however, so let me try to be clear in the time I'm allowed it. Um, synthetic turf, as David Nardone mentioned, is essentially plastic shag carpet. It is essentially 99% polyethylene. The remaining 1% does contain a few other things. It contains a dye, usually green, although at UMass Lowell it happens to be blue for some odd reason. So there's an artificial dye that represents maybe a half a percent or maybe a little less. There is a stabilizer to try to prevent the dye from fading under sunlight over the years. And there is finally, at a level of less than half a percent, one and only one kind of perfluorinated alkyl substance. It is a fluorocopolymer. This is well known. This has been written up in patents for decades. Five decades. seconds, Laura. And it is PVDF HFP. It is not water-soluble. It is not volatile. It is not toxic. And, it is and that's your time. May I please finish my <laughs> sentence? <laughs> Thanks, Jeff, for timing us. I'd also just like to add that um, any synthetic turf field that you do comes with a manufacturer's warranty and a third-party insured warranty. Okay. We need to move on. Um, okay. Two new questions. Um, the oral one will be from Dean Regent. Regent? Regent. <laughs> okay. But first we'll do the written question, um, which are, what are the comparative dollar costs over the life cycle of each option? Purchase, installation, maintenance, et cetera. Um, and we'll start with Parks and Rec. Yeah. I I mean, that's a pretty detailed question to get into it at this time to do a cost analysis of synthetic turf versus natural grass. There's many different synthetic turf systems, as David Nardone pointed out, different types of infill, different types of fiber, whether it has a pad or not, what the use um, and play is on that field. Same with natural grass fields. There's so many different types of soil types, the sand content, it's, is there drainage underneath or not? How much use does it get? Uh, what are the maintenance requirements? For example, uh, Robin's field that we did back in 2016-17 is what's considered a high-performance sand-based natural grass field. It does not have any underdrains in it. But that was a field where because of uh, how it was engineered, all the existing topsoil was exported off-site, and all new material with at least an 85% sand content was imported on-site. It's That cost analysis, it requires much more thought and okay. consideration. Thank you. Um, Conservation Commission? Thank you. Um, um, I actually you want did me to jump in on that? 
Sure, sure, Rachel, just leave me at uh, one minute, uh, okay. half a minute, sorry, half a minute. Okay. Sorry. So, yeah. so really quickly, so, um, so, so we've, we've looked at costs um, in the work that we did at the Toxic Use Reduction Institute, um, and not to get into numbers, but just if you think about the comparison with an artificial turf field, you've got your installation cost, and then it is not maintenance-free. You have to do a variety of maintenance activities over time, and then at the end of its useful life, at about a decade, you have to deal with the replacement costs, the disposal and replacement costs. Um, whereas with natural grass, if you invest a modest amount over time and maintain it regularly, um, you can keep it going for, a, for again, a modest cost. Um, Springfield spends about $1,500 per acre on their organic field. So, Susan. Yes, thank you, uh, Dr. Massey. Um, I did a back of the envelope calculation, which I don't have here. Um, about the comparison of artificial turf um, maintenance and life cycle costs to natural fields at, based on the synthetic turf um, industry's own information. Time, Susan. Okay, and um, taking all the life cycle costs, uh, the, the turf fields are more expensive over the life cycle of about 20 to 25 years because the field has to be replaced. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. All right, we're gonna go to Dean. Hi, um, thanks for coming out tonight and uh, sharing your information. I'm curious about the, um, if you could just talk a little bit about the demand for fields and where Arlington, like how many fields do we have relative to how much usage is, is um, demanded from different activities? How does that compare to neighboring towns? And what I think I'm hearing is that there is probably more demand than there is supply currently. So if we were to go to an all grass field solution, um, what are the options for where those fields would be located? Okay, so this one will start with Conservation Commission. I don't really have an answer to that. That's a park and rec question in terms of use of fields and where are they located. I can only tell you that currently the fields that we have, the grass fields, as well as uh, some artificial turf fields, are currently located in or near wetland resource areas in our town. Um, the, the larger Arlington High School field, the football field that has the track around it, is not in a jurisdictional area and was not permitted by the commission. Um, but all the other fields pretty much are in jurisdictional areas or near jurisdictional areas. And I guess I can add, just based on the other communities that we have, where we've done case studies, um, that the communities that do make that investment in sustainable or organic management of their natural grass fields do find that they're able to fully meet the needs of the community. So obviously each community is different, but if you, um, if you do the, the soil aeration and the soil testing um, and build a healthy soil ecosystem and root system, which I know we haven't talked about today. All right. Thank um, you, Rachel. But um, if you make that investment, then you can, um, then generally communities are quite satisfied with the an amount of playable hours that All they right. get. We're going to go now to Parks and Rec. Yeah, I, I believe the question was um, more of a supply and demand question. Is that correct? Yeah. So basically the question of you know how many fields are we short based on enrollment? Um, that's how I interpreted it. Joe Conley, our director of recreation, is um, you know more informed on what our needs are. But I can just tell you, in general, a synthetic turf field equals um, about three natural grass fields in terms of use. Uh, as I pointed out earlier, they can basically be played on 24/7. But if Joe wants to add anything. Yeah, sure. Um, so I could ask uh, Henry, I could ask Paul, I could ask Dan, I could ask John Bowler, I could ask Dan Shine. We don't have enough fields, period. Um, Arlington Youth Lacrosse, quite frankly, wouldn't exist if they weren't allowed to use the fields over at Belmont Hill. Um, every single spring, particularly every single fall, it is a huge juggling act. Phil mentioned it in his previous comment about soccer, um, having to leave Dallin, leave Florence, and go over to McLennan. So to That's just because just basically not enough field space. Okay, so. thank you. Okay, two new questions. Um, the oral one, which will follow the written, is for Robin Bergman. Anyways, okay. Um, and we will start with the written question. 
how much water does a natural turf field need in a season? Um, and we're going to start with Parks and Rec on this one. Can you repeat that again? Yeah. How much water does a natural turf field need in a season? Um, typically, a properly irrigated field would require, David, one to two inches? An inch a week. An inch a week of water. Uh, I don't. I don't know the exact amount that a that a, a natural turf field needs. I will say though that it's incorrect statement to say that artificial turf fields do not need irrigation. It's common to irrigate artificial turf fields in very hot weather to mitigate for the heat effects. So I'll just leave it there. If there's a little bit of time, I'd like to oh. refute that. Um, I, sorry, I, can that, I? That is in. That is still, in. This is still. Is it still Conservation Commission's time? Yeah. Yeah. Um, I'll just add that um, again in the case studies that we've done at the Toxic Use Reduction Institute, we did look at communities that um, that did smart irrigation. So, um, so there are a variety of techniques that you can use to um, to keep water use to a minimum. Um, some communities actually. Um, use drone photography to identify uh, patches of a field that need extra attention, and then they can use um, smart irrigation systems where you're not putting the same amount of water on the field um, at all times. So anyway, just, these are just things you might want to consider if you're thinking about time, kind of upgrading Rachel. your maintenance in, in Arlington. Yeah, I just want so to I'm point gonna, out. I'm going to ask you to put that in the two minutes at the end. I just don't want us to get into a back. Sure, I just want to make sure this is a forum about synthetic turf, not natural grass. Okay. And so, and irrigation we are, systems we're aren't used going. on synthetic turf. You can you can add that in your two minutes. Okay. All right. We're going to go to our oral question from Robin. You have one minute. Is this working? Yes. Yeah. Hi, Robin Bergman. Um, I'd like you to talk a little bit about the so-called organic infills and what chemicals and substances they are um, treated with in order to be used and maintained. I've heard that they get hard and they need certain things. I've heard that they need certain other kind of chemicals to keep them from decaying. I'd like to know more about those. Thank you. Thank you. Um, so this one, last time we started with Conservation Commission, this time we'll start with Parks and Rec. Uh, sure. First of all, we don't call them organic infills. They're called natural infills. Um, so there's walnut shells, there's uh, cork, there's coconut husks, and there's pine. Uh, I'll probably have Dr. Green uh, comment on, on those uh, items, but there's really no chemicals that I'm aware of in the processing of them. Dr. Green, would you like to add anything? Yeah, uh, yeah thank you very much. I've done extensive analyses um, using an independent uh, certified laboratory that I'm sure Ms. Chapnick's familiar with, Alpha Analytical Laboratories here in Massachusetts. Um, the pine infill that was proposed for the, uh, that is proposed for the Martha's Vineyard Project is um, a virgin pine um, from trees that are grown in North Florida and South Georgia. Um, the pine is, as Wendy mentioned, literally cleaner than dirt. Five seconds. Can, um, no detectable levels of lead, no detectable levels of arsenic, no detectable levels of PFAS 6, with one exception. Um, Laura, and you're out of time. PFAS, with one exception, it was not a PFAS 6, it was another PFAS found at uh, trace levels uh, because the uh, roots of the plant translocated from soil. Okay. Uh, but the pine, the pine infill is not treated with anything. Thank you, Laura. All right, so now we're going to go to Conservation Commission. Rachel, um, can okay, you I guess I can say a little you. about that. Um, so, yeah, when, when at the Toxic Seas Reduction Institute, we did our comparison of infills that were on the market, we were trying to find an infill that, that we could be confident in um, as a safer alternative to tire crumb at the time. Um, as I said before, we weren't able to identify any one that was entirely free of concerns. Um, but again, I think it's a matter of, of, of asking the questions and doing the testing. Um, 
so you want to find out whether a material has been treated with any chemicals prior to being put into the product that you're purchasing, and then also find out whether any chemicals are going to be required for maintenance, any kind of um, fungal control or, or um, antibacterials. Um, so these are just things that you need to, to find out if you're, if you're planning to purchase Five these seconds. materials. And then um, I guess the, the Martha's Vineyard did some testing on the Brockville in particular and found presence of certain PFAS. Again, and this is something time, that Rachel. I would just recommend looking into yourselves. Okay. I'm sorry, but that's Thank incorrect. You. It's completely incorrect. Laura, it's we're going to have time incorrect. in the last um, few I'm minutes. I'm sorry, but it's factually incorrect. Laura, we're going to have two minutes for each uh, commission to respond to anything at the end. Okay, we have two more questions. <laughs> okay, so the oral one, which will follow the written, is from Larry Shotnick. Slotnick? Okay, we have a hand. And we'll do the written one first. What covered options are available for turf fields? Does coverage make a difference when it comes to environmental impacts, to health impacts? I don't understand the question. What? Coverage? What was the second word in that question? Cover covered options. Okay, so this question we're not quite sure of. <laughs> so if this was your question, if you want to come to the table over here and maybe clarify, that would be great. I'm going to pick one more written one. No, or this one is. I'm going to pick one more written one first before we go to Larry. I think the commenter probably meant like a tarp, like on Fenway Park. A tarp. Does that? Okay, so we'll, we'll have that person clarify at the table. Um, Joe, I'm going to give it to you. Okay. All right. What, so this is a new one. What specific studies can you cite regarding the risk of breathing volatile organic compounds during athletic activities on artificial fields, especially at different ambient temperatures? So this one we're, we started last time with, Park, with Parks and Rec, so I think we go to Conservation Commission. Oh, did you say? Oh, I'm sorry. <laughs> Rachel. <laughs> yeah, it's that. Yeah. Yeah, 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 yeah. Okay. Okay, I'll, I'll, I'll say a few words and then maybe you. Wendy may want to say something as well. Um, yeah, so um, there, it, it, among the studies that have been done on artificial turf fields, there are various studies that have looked for um, chemicals that are found in tire crumb and looked at them at various levels above the field and tried to figure out how much people are breathing in. Um, there have also been studies that have looked at just the particulate matter that people may be breathing in, so small, small particles of, of the rubber and plastic. Um, when temperatures are high, you're going to have um, more of those chemicals coming off the field. So um, it's an exposure that you have to consider when you're using these products. Um, and yeah, maybe, I don't know if there's really any more to say. 15 that. seconds? 10 seconds? 15. There are research studies ongoing where people are using wristbands and ankle bands to, to um, where the chemicals that are vaporizing off the fields will be adsorbed to those wristbands, and they will, those chemicals will be analyzed in the laboratory and published soon. And that's time. Thank you. Okay. So next up, we're going to go to Parks and Rec. Yeah, I'll have um, Jeff talk quickly. Great. So to sp specific to the question, I'm not aware of any studies that um, speak about crumb rubber breathing in. What I can attest to is the methods that we use to address all the concerns that we're talking about here. This isn't a situation where there's not a method to, to know what's in the infill. We know what's in everything. This, there isn't questions to this. We can reverse engineer anything here we're talking about. Okay, so there, there's not a, a question to what's in here, and there's methods to establish the quantities, and then we deal with tolerance to, to see whether it's too much or too little based on the, what the, the local requirements are. May I please add a tiny bit if there's a moment? Yes, Laura. Okay. 15 seconds. So um, 12 years ago, there was a very good study in the Netherlands looking at soccer players who played on synthetic pitch. For, that's synthetic turf in their language, for two and a half hours. Urine samples were taken for 24 hours before the match, 
24 hours during and after the match, and then waiting a day and 24 hours later. And that's time, and thank the you. Urine. Well, do you want to know the answer or not? Fine, whatever, Abby. Okay. I'm sorry, people. I'm trying to keep us on schedule and so we don't get into back and forth. We're getting here from where? Answer, and I'm trying to answer the question. May I please have 10 more seconds? Well, you can, you can address it in the two minutes. Okay, Larry. Uh, I'm a soccer-centric parent in Arlington. In a typical year with two 10-week soccer seasons, fall and spring, uh, do we have any information about how many uh, heat-related illnesses uh, occur amongst the, the youth that are playing during those two 10-week seasons? We'll start with Parks and Rec. In Arlington. Yeah, I'm not aware of, uh, of anything. I think, you know, the athletic director at the high school or um, Joe Conley may be better to speak to that. I have not been made aware of any heat-related illnesses regarding um, Arlington's turf and Mr. Shine, the athletic director of Arlington Catholic, so he's shaking his head. He has not been aware of any on his field as well. It, it's a, you know it's an issue that's managed. Anybody that owns one of these fields that has kids out on them, they manage their their time. They manage the you know water consumption on and off the field. It's it's summer camps that is the concern. That's really not you know seasonal programs and they you know provides shade and so on and they manage it and it's it's a combination of coaches and trainers and people being responsible and, and I haven't heard of a single instance of one of my clients having an issue if I can add just 10 seconds um, well, I'm, I'm sorry we're at time and folks I just want to clarify what's happening here there are different amounts of panelists for each commission but we've agreed to be clear on having the same amount of time for each commission so what's happening, you're seeing multiple people weigh in, but we're keeping the same time, and that's what's happening. Okay. We're going to go to the Conservation Commission. Sure. Those con that kind of data should be reported. It should be gathered. Those data are not gathered. Um, and so what we have done um, in, certainly in Lexington, where we did not actually approve the synthetic field, we allocated the money to, for, for a field. So that's not a done deal. With regard to heat-related illnesses, those are only now being tracked as they're being tracked in uh, um, other communities as well. And local boards of health are starting to ask coaches and others to keep track of that information. And I'll add that um, it, there's recommendations from the Mount Sinai School of Medicine to um, be extremely cautious about heat-related hazards on artificial turf fields. So heat-related illness is an incredibly serious health hazard when it and occurs. And that's time, Rachel. Um, okay. Thank you. Okay. So we probably have time for these two as our last questions because we want to leave time for people to share all of the thoughts that they haven't gotten to um, before we close out. Um, okay, so the oral questions for John Rice. Do we have John? Okay. Um, and the written question, which we'll do first, is what habitat is at risk if a turf field is installed over the current field, the field only, please, at Poets Corner, which is a capped former landfill per Sandy Pooler? Question mark. Okay, and so we're going to start this time with Conservation Commission. Um, well, thank you for that question. The current Poets Corner field is likely outside of a wetland resource area. Um, again, we don't have the delineation, but it looks like it is. It's a smaller field. It still will impact habitat in that you lose the opportunity for any kind of of habitat for invertebrates in the soil, for foraging birds, in vegetation, small mammals, and of course wildlife won't want to walk across it, especially in the heat. Then you also have climate resilient 
considerations and the fact that it's not a sustainable solution and has to be replaced. The issue that we keep bringing up that this is over a cap landfill, um, please understand that we have other cap landfills in Arlington. McLennan Park is a capped landfill. It's capped with a soil and grass field. And that's time, Susan. Thank you. Yeah, I mean, a natural grass field is essentially a monoculture. Um, I don't know that it provides much habitat, and that's really all I have to say there. Yeah, you want to add something, Jay? Yeah, so, I mean, with any development, synthetic turf field, building, parking lot, store, right, the impact on the environment is really proportional. It's the, it's the size of that development in relation to the size of the habitat surrounding it, right? So if you have a wooded, decent sized wooded area and you take a small piece of it and turn it into something developed, then it doesn't have much effect on the overall habitat. If you take the only piece of habitat within an area and you turn it into something developed, then it has a big effect on a habitat. Great, thanks. All right. Um, now we're gonna go to John. Hi. Yeah, just uh, real quickly, I'm part of the Arlington Ultimate Club. We have a huge amount of unmet demand where we have kids that would like to play Ultimate, but we just don't have field space and time. Um, today, with the rain, we had probably 60 or 70 athletes that were, instead of running around playing, were uh, home, uh, sedentary. We have partial use of the turf, um, so we get some days where we can be assured of playing, but a lot of days we can't, especially this spring. I'm just wondering if any of the medical or scientific professionals up there can comment on the deleterious effects of being sedentary uh, when kids could otherwise be playing. Okay. So this one we're going to start with Parks and Rec and then go to ConCon. I mean, I can tell you this. Um, I'm sure there's a lot of parents here tonight whose kids didn't get to play sports today and are probably home on a screen instead. So, I don't know, ask yourself, would you rather have them on a screen or would you rather have them out being physically active, um, you know, for their mental health as well? Anyone else um, from Parks and Rec? Okay. We'll go to, we can go to ConCom. Um, okay, so I can just say, um, again, just working from the communities where we've done case studies, um, uh, we looked in detail at the experience of Springfield. So the, um, the only weather-related cancellations that they did routinely in the period of time that we were looking at was for baseball, baseball and that was because of the, um, the clay infield. Um, being affected by the rain, but they were basically not canceling games due to rain, except if there was heavy rain for um, a long period of time, like an entire day. Um, similarly, in case studies that we've done in other areas, we looked at a, a college field where they decided to make the investment in fully rebuilding the field with a sand cap. Um, so it had been a field that had lots of pooling of water. Um, and they, after they rebuilt it, it basically drained really fast so that they didn't have any cancellations. And Martha's and that's been here, time, Rachel. the approach, okay. Yeah, the, the past three days we've been canceled okay. in Arlington. So we're gonna, so that's gonna conclude our Q&A portion of the evening. What we're now gonna do is we're gonna give each commission um, three minutes to say anything that you have not yet been able to say. How many minutes? Three minutes total. We're gonna start with ConCom, and then we're gonna go to Parks and Rec. Um, and I will just say again to the panelists, I know there are many of you and you have to share this time and that stinks, <laughs> but um, that's, what, that's how it is right now. Okay, so we're gonna start with ConCom for three minutes, whenever you're ready. Thank you. I just want to want to say that I um, I feel it's a, a false comparison in our town. Um, we have very poorly maintained natural turf fields. I think 
we don't do a good job of maintenance, not just on fields, on a lot of things in the town. And I think we don't put enough capital towards maintenance. I'm not blaming anyone. I think that's just a fact in our town. I would hope that that would get um, fixed in the future. So the comparison to our fields, which are very poorly maintained and do get wet and muddy, is not a fair comparison compared to a well-managed organic field. Um, I will just, I, I want to respond to Dr. Green's statement about PV, PVDF, uh, that statement about the chemical in the, um, yeah, in the turf um, must be corrected. In a study in 2021, it was shown that under UV light, which is sunlight, it has been shown that this chemical is released and it is not inert. Rachel? Um, let's see, I guess um, the thing that I would say as a wrap up is that um, it's really important to kind of just look at the safer alternatives. So if you're making a decision as a community about what you want to invest in, you have some money available for a capital investment, um, take a look at what it would take to improve the management of your natural grass fields. Right now you could start doing it today um, and you could make it a better experience for players um, this summer this spring, um, and then take a look at what it would look, what it would look like to, to do that bigger investment um, to rebuild some of your fields. Um, so again, just in my background in toxic use reduction, work with large and small businesses, we've always, what we always come back to is you need to look at the safer alternative because only then can you really make an informed decision. Do you have a minute to say that? I think, um, just, yeah, uh, I will just say in conclusion, thank you very much, everybody who's attended tonight. Um, we hope that you learned something, and if not, we hope you raise some questions and you can talk to your neighbors about, because this is a very important decision in our town. And ultimately, when we do get a project that comes before the Conservation Commission, I might just add that if it's in a resource area, it is the Conservation Commission's decision whether or not the project will get approved. Thank you. All right. Thank you. Um, so we are now going to go to three minutes for Park and Rec panelists. Great. I'm going to pass most of my time off to Dr. Green so she can finish a lot of her questions. Just quickly, as I said before, irrigation is not used on infilled turf fields and it hasn't been for years. Um, it was found to actually raise heat and humidity. Uh, Dr. Green, you have plenty to uh, respond to since yeah, you were cut thanks. off so um, much. I actually want to more fully answer one of the very good questions that a gentleman in the audience asked, which is what are we going to learn if we study this more for months or years? Um, I want to say a couple of things that I think are important. Um, while it is certainly true that science learns new things every day, every week, and every year, and while it's certainly true that synthetic turf has morphed from its original days as AstroTurf in the 1960s to uh, much better products today, the fact is that this stuff has been around since the 1960s. Literally, 1964 or 65 is when AstroTurf was first laid in a stadium. That was a long time ago. I was 10 years old. It just so happens also that 1964 is the same year that in Torrance, California, as some of you soccer fans may know, the first, and as far as I know, the largest nonprofit youth so soccer organization in America was formed, the AYSO, the American Youth Soccer Organization. It was formed in Torrance, Connecticut, uh, Torrance California. To my knowledge, there are now something like 900 communities where children are playing youth soccer under the AYSO banner. And I can tell you, because two of my grandchildren are in that program, in inner city Los Angeles, where it is hotter than Hades. They play on synthetic turf. There are no natural fields in Southern California. There's no water in Southern California. The vast majority of these 900 communities in Southern California, Middle California, all throughout Texas, the vast majority are synthetic turf. And they've been synthetic turf since the 60s, 70s, 80s, and through today. The idea that they're unsafe is simply incorrect. Yes, they are hot. 
Yes, they are hot. So is a tennis court. So is an outdoor basketball court. You don't play barefoot. And the idea that um, these fields would somehow be unplayable in Arlington, Massachusetts in July and August, relative to the kind of communities that play on these things in Phoenix, Arizona, inner city Los Angeles, et cetera, it's just absurd. Thank you. Anything else? I got a few more seconds, so I'd just like to comment on um, Dr. Massey's comment about, um, you know, natural grass fields as an alternative. Basically, if we did that, we'd have to cap enrollment. We just don't have the field space. We're a small urban community. Um, natural grass fields are, are not the answer here. We've been down this road before. Thank you, and I appreciate everybody's participation this evening. Okay. All right. Thanks, everyone. Thanks to the panelists. Um, this has been a lot of your time tonight and <laughs> the last few weeks. I just want to cover a few logistics, and then we'll have a closing from town manager Sandy Pooler. Okay, two things. One is that CBI, Brandon, and I will be working on a summary of this town forum where we'll cover the key points of the presentation and the questions and answers. Um, if you signed up on the email list by the doors, we'll send it to you that way, or I think we'll try to be sh share it through the commission um, newsletters and through the town meeting um, listserv. Um, we will try to get this out to you before May 8th. Um, we will do our best. And then lastly, logistics-wise, is we there's a feedback form. Um, there's a slide, Jim, if you don't mind. There's a QR code, which will be up in a minute. Um, and then we'll leave that up. And then there's also paper forms in the back if you want. And that asks you if you'd like to share lingering questions that you have, um, feedback you'd like the commissions to hear, and um, any additional engagement or information you would like on artificial turf. Um, and with that, I'll, I'll leave it to Sandy to close us out. Thank you, Abby. And, and thank you all for your participation tonight. Um, I would urge you, or I would recommend to you, um, to talk to your town meeting representatives about uh, what you heard tonight or how you feel about it, uh, because we do have this article coming up, and to continue to pay attention to this issue as we go forward. Um, I certainly learned a few things tonight. Um, I also have more questions than I started out with, so, you know, that's good. <laughs> um, I would particularly like to thank all of the panelists. I know that everybody here uh, has Arlington's best interest in mind, and I want to tell you uh, from talking to some of these people directly and meeting some of them tonight, I have nothing but respect for uh, the people here at the front of the room and the people uh, we've seen on Zoom. Um, they, I know they care deeply about Arlington and about our environment and about our children. Um, so, again, thank you all for your participation uh, and have a nice evening. <laughs>